Um, so, uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about post-infectious inflammation and long-term health, but with a particular window onto long COVID and more. Um, so, the, the general theme really is um, post-viral sequelae. Um, so, for obvious reasons, a lot of emphasis on COVID-19 and long COVID with some words in between about what we've tried to learn from other examples, things like um, Ebola virus infection, chikungunya virus infection, and um, acute Epstein-Barr virus infection. So um, I suspect that my focus on long COVID probably needs no justification or introduction at this stage. So th this cartoon comes from um, a very prominent um, long COVID activist and artist called Monique Jackson, who has an Instagram called Long COVID Diary. And this is her really way back at the beginning of our understanding of long COVID, um, trying desperately to convince her doctor that she has something and something is going on um, and facing disbelief that she's even had COVID, which is a very familiar um, slightly desperate kind of scenario. So um, I think Rosemary Boyton and I published what may have been the first um, peer-reviewed um, paper in a, in a clinical journal um, on um, long COVID. And it was a kind of um, manifesto to, to lay down our direction of travel. Um, at the time, we didn't know whether this would be something that would be um, months, years, or lifelong. We don't know if it's lifelong, but we certainly know by now that for many, many people, it's a story of years. Um, at the beginning, I guess our analysis was rather skewed to um, the COVID-19 patients that we saw a lot of, one heard a lot of, the ones who um, tended to be older and higher BMI and hospitalized um, extremely, extremely unwell, you know, often ventilated. Um, and they, at the beginning, um, kind of shaped a lot of our thinking about um, chronic sequelae of COVID-19. And of course, now we know that actually those people probably aren't the most typical long COVID sufferers. Um, a typical long COVID demographic probably covers um, people who tend to be younger, more normal BMI, um, somewhat um, female skewed um, and um, often, um, you know, previously healthy, active people and often not hospitalized and often because of the way the, the pandemic ran its course with no um, health service um, um, information on their, their PCR status or antibody status. Um, so we were faced with this uncharted pathophysiology and we said at the time that we quite desperately needed diagnostic tests, something that many of us are still working on and looking for. And as often happens in these kind of situations, you kind of need the epidemiology before you can have the investigative medicine, um, because before you can intervene in the situation, you need to be able to at least count whether it exists and where it exists and how much of it exists. Um, but I think our plea was that at a time when a lot of the research was purely um, or only epidemiolog epidemiological, was to move from the observational to the interventional. Um, and, you know, as ever, it's, um, it's foolhardy to try and put any numbers or counting on anything in times of COVID, because as soon as you make a slide or publish an article, the, um, the number is obsolete. So at the time we wrote this, um, this paper, um, we talked about um, 20 to 40 million long, co long COVID cases globally. Um, now we tend to talk about upwards of 150 million and who knows, you know, that figure will move as well. Um, um, but just emphasizing the need to resolve mechanisms so that we can move towards rational therapeutics. Um, so in the um, in the UK where I'm speaking from, um, we were, you know, perhaps for once, you know, somewhat ahead of the curve in these kind of questions, um, and 
put in place relatively early um, the um, some kind of infrastructure and staffing and budget for dedicated long COVID clinics. Um, but it hasn't been an entirely easy or happy story, um, you know, two and a half years into the, um, the sort of long hauler experience. Um, we're still don't have a smooth path to ensure how you get referred there. Um, which clinical specialties um, are staffing them? Um, what particular expertise, testing equipment, um, imaging they need? Um, how to deal with the fact that a person's symptoms um, may move between needing support from um, neurology, rheumatology, cardiology, endocrinology, respiratory teams, um, putting in place um, some kind of management or therapeutics, um, and, you know, all the big questions about healthcare planning, um, how many years will we need these clinics for, and where are we to, um, to find the... Um, the staff to fill them um, and do we train new staff or, or what do we do um, these these are big questions so so although the UK was was maybe um, rightly proud for having got stuck into this early um, I think the um, the patient experience has not been an entirely happy or easy one and many don't don't feel well well served by this despite um, you know great efforts of, of many talented clinical teams so in the case of, of long COVID investigations, um, at the time we put down some um, some non mutually exclusive working hypotheses, and although many ideas have come along, and now a few years into this, there are many um, kind of rather siloed schools of thought. I think these still stand up as general subject headings, um, offering a kind of framework for investigation. So the first thing to say is just perhaps the most glaringly obvious that um, there are many um, ACE2 positive cells in many um, tissues and organs around the body. And um, so um, SARS-CoV-2 is, is a rather um, cytotoxic virus. So um, if it has managed to get into um, different tissues, this will have um, an effect on end organ damage. Um, Perhaps my only objection to that as a kind of general principle is if that were a big driver, then long COVID um, prevalence and severity would be kind of correlated with um, severity of the acute infection, which it isn't. And also it would be very tightly correlated with end organ damage on imaging, which it isn't. So yeah, so it's in the mix, but I'm not sure if it's a, a big, big driver. Um, one could imagine that um, ongoing immune stimulation from um, reservoirs of persistent virus, such as um, in the gut, um, drives the phenotype. Um, and that's obviously a biggie and an exciting point and one that much of biopharma is, is rather keen on because um, if we really believe that there's at least a, a major subset of patients who have this problem, then that's, um, you know, that's kind of um, low hanging fruit for an intervention, isn't it? You know, it might be expected to be rather, rather effective. Um, one might imagine, and we'll talk about this in a moment, that um, perhaps acute infection causes some kind of perturbation of immune subsets. So think about things like glandular fever following um, EBV or about CMV. Um, or one might imagine that um, acute infection causes activation of an autoimmune response, um, which would you know, take into account many of the phenotypes seen including um, prothrombotic autoantibodies, antiphospholipid syndrome, um, endotheliitis, um, you know, you, you name it, could be covered under that kind of heading. Um, and as we'll discuss in a moment, I've said C under chikungunya virus. Um, so here are a few of my other examples of, of just stuff we tried to look at for any kind of um, prior knowledge on um, these kind of chronic conditions after viral infection. So a lot of people perhaps you know, don't take note of the fact, you know, we think of Ebola as being this, um, you know, high mortality acute infection. But if you look at long term follow up of cohorts like this very famous one published in New England Journal from the Prevail 3 study group, um, 
as those cohorts have been followed year after year after year, um, they um, you know they have a long term chronic um, multi system multi organ phenotype. Um, you know, urinary frequency, headache, fatigue, muscle pain, memory loss, joint pain, um, and um, abnormal abdominal chest neurologic and um, musculoskeletal findings. Um, so, um, you know, some kind of um, obviously terribly, terribly different virus, but some kind of template there for considering um, really long term lingering um, post viral phenotypes. Um, Another one that I often refer to is this, and I've, I've referred to it in the past, as like throwing um, a hand grenade into your immune subsets, because obviously for people who are um, aficionados of um, immune system flow cytometry, you're looking at um, thousands of different populations of um, interacting cell types. Um, and yet, you know, look at this kind of paper, not, not one from our group at all, um, an old kind of classic from the EBV literature in um, JX Med, um, what, 20 years ago now, but look what it's showing. So in those fax plots, um, as you go from acute EBV infection to 14 months down the line, if you use tetramers to home in on even um, a single um, epitope-specific population of CD8 T cells against a, you know, a minuscule fraction of the EBV proteome, um, you see that um, you know 14 months down the line, um, what you know five percent, eight percent of the entire repertoire is occupied still with one EBV epitope. Um, so um, you know, I guess you might say, well, you know, that's kind of a special case, isn't it? Because that's um, that's a, a latent virus that's hanging around in the body. Um, but I guess for things like SARS-CoV-2, as we just discussed in terms of persistent virus, we don't know if it's hanging around or how much of it is hanging around or exactly where. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm interested in that example. And the, the third um, kind of post-viral example I wanted to mention is another one that we work on. This is not one of our papers. It's um, a, um, a, a paper from, from uh, ASTAR Singapore, from um, Lisa Nug's lab, um, reminding us that in chikungunya virus infection, so um, you know an arbovirus infection um, spread in temperate countries by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, um, once you've had your um, your acute infection with your um, you know um, rash and myalgia and fever and, and what have you, um, a significant minority of people won't really recover. They'll go into a, a chronic phase that can last for many years, um, with a you know a fairly classic-looking arthralgia, um, which has a, a kind of query autoimmune status. Um, and as we came into COVID, that was something we were trying to look at. And what we've done now is to bolt our um, chikungunya consortium across different um, clinical centres in Brazil onto a COVID clinical consortium together with the chap you can see here, um, Andre Segura, um, to try and really nail down the comparative genomics and transcriptomics and immunomics um, of um, acute resolving to, compared to chronic chikungunya infection. So we've tried to kind of pull together all of these thoughts and concepts and ideas into a, um, a big um, kind of cohort study program for long COVID in the UK. So we were one of the groups who successfully um, got funded by the National Institute for Health Research. And we called our study um, Immune Analysis of Long COVID to inform rational choices in diagnostic, diagnostic testing and therapeutics. Um, but because that was a bit of a mouthful for our patient recruitment, we renamed it the Wilco study um, for a kind of does what it says on the tin kind of name, which is um, working out the immunology of long COVID. And we've been recruiting people who are not the kind of hospitalized people, they're the kind of out in the community people who either have never had COVID but just been vaccinated or had COVID but made a full recovery in good time. And those people are surprisingly hard to find. 
um, or continue to suffer things like fatigue, brain fog, um, exhaustion on walking, breathlessness, chest pain. And what we do with those people is we get them in um, to the clinic and we just kind of throw the whole molecular immunology toolkit at them in the way that immunologists like to do. So we do um, site off and, and um, conventional multi-parameter flow to build up pictures of immune subsets. We do comprehensive autoantibody screening against the whole human proteome. We use that to guide studies of autoimmune T cells. And we also do um, transcriptome analysis to look for changes in immune programs. And because the long COVID programs, both in the UK and to a large extent around the world, have been, you know, rather networked and, and linked up in, in, in quite a positive way, we've been able to team up with these many cohort studies shown here on the left to do our analyses. Um, so the example we show here um, is the, um, the uh, human proteome arrays to light up positive autoantibody profiles and then use um, principal components analysis to identify patterns of autoimmunity identified with different phenotypes. So th this is um, a little bit of, of, of pilot data from that. It's, it's a collaboration between our lab and a very nice um, study that's um, been published under the name CoverScan, which is a, um, a kind of dedicated um, whole body MRI protocol that's been used to look at examples of um, specific end organ damage in long COVID. So what we did was to um, home in on some of their um, kind of favorite patterns of, um, of um, MRI damage, in this case, um, lung damage, and correlate that with um, changes in um, autoantibody repertoire. So, um, you know, I think there's an awful lot to do um, on, on, on long COVID and awful lot to work out, um, even more than we envisaged in that um, early BMJ paper. Um, so this is to remind me to, to show you the, the UK data from the, the ONS survey that, um, you know, nobody is spared from long COVID. Um, this shows you the, um, the accrual of cases um, across the age range and, you know, we're doing it to young people at work, we're doing it to teenagers, we're doing it to the elderly. Um, they're all paying a very high price for the extent of our, of our pandemic. And I'd kind of rather hoped that um, with a so-called mild variant, like the Omicron subvariants in a vaccinated population, um, long COVID would, would be a thing of the past. Um, but even that's not entirely true, because if you look at this graph, um, during 2022, in the Delta and then the Omicron subvariant waves, the UK alone has added another 1 million people into its um, long COVID caseload. So le let me finish um, on some, some bad news and some good news. Um, how long will it last? Um, so I regarded um, SARS and long SARS from 2003 to 2004 as a, as a kind of crystal ball for this. And I tracked down John Patkai, the consultant who looked after the long SARS patients at University of Toronto. And well, you can read it for yourself. He says, um, and none of our patients got their old lives back with time and treatment. Some were never able to return to work. Some had a trial of return to work and failed. Some had a trial of return to modified work, which then failed. So um, that's fairly, um, What's well, yeah, true, truly, truly horrific. Um, you know, so by any standards, this is a, a major health burden. Um, to finish on a tiny bit of good news, if you look at the UK ONS data for the last couple of months, although we're stacking up Omicron cases, um, people seem to be um, you know, recovering faster than recurring new cases. So cases are actually going down now from 2 million to 1.8 million. So I'll, I'll finish by thanking all the members of the lab who've worked with us on this and all of our collaborators um, across many centres and consortia. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll
That was really a terrific presentation. I'm so glad that you were able to join us for the Q&A. And uh, we'll now open this for questions for people here in the room. If you'll raise your hands, uh, we'll have someone with a microphone come over to you so that uh, everybody can hear the question. And for those of you who are participating uh, virtually, if you type your questions in using the Q&A uh, uh, um, widget, then we'll see them here on my iPad and I'll be able to read your question for you. So uh, first question uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Pyardini, microphone number three. And it, I suppose I should ask people to uh, identify themselves when they ask the question. Yeah. Th thank you, great presentation. Mirko Pyardini from Emory University. Just uh, to, to try to go back to the question on mechanism, do you have uh, any hypothesis why is uh, long COVID more frequent on women? And also, uh, if you compare people that get infected without being vaccinated, people that get infected after vaccine, and people that are just vaccinated without being infected, for what we know, if there is any data on the frequency of long COVID in those three scenarios. Were you, were you able to hear the question? I'm not sure. Is us at all. Are, are you able to hear us at all? <laughs> oh, I'm just to you. I can hear you now. Ah, ah. Were you able to hear the question or not? No, I'm sorry. I didn't hear a word. Oh, OK. We'll ask, we'll ask uh, Mirko to repeat the question then. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. So I was asking if you have any hypothesis why uh, long COVID seems to be more frequent in women, and also if you compare three categories of individuals, those infected without a vaccine, those infected after being vaccinated, or those only vaccinated, if there is any data on the frequency of long COVID in those three categories. Yeah, all great questions. So um, let me make a few comments about gender. Um, first of all, one that seems almost trivial now, doesn't it, that at the beginning when we talked about long COVID, we often talked about it being in um, high BMI older males. And that I think it was a kind of artifact of the severe cases that we looked at early in the first wave. And now obviously when we talk about long COVID, if anything, there's no typical long COVID, but we often tend to think of somebody who's younger and female and often normal BMI. And as you can imagine, the, the only context I've got for that is thinking about the um, possible autoimmune etiology or autoimmune component and the idea that you know, many autoimmune diseases are skewed towards females um, because of um, you know, sex hormone regulation of immune subsets and Tregs and things like that. Um, so, you know, that's that's a kind of work in progress and hypothesis I think many people are looking at. And then the question about um, um, different categories um, with or without vaccination. Um, so I think that's a tricky one and it really speaks to the complexities of the etiology that, um, you know, if you'd asked me what I thought, I would have predicted that in a time of so-called milder variants and double and triple vaccinated people, um, long COVID would be um, an absolute thing of the past. And as you know, that's very much not the case, including the slides that I, sh that I showed. Um, and from some published studies, um, notably the um, study in the British Medical Journal, British Medical Journal from um, Nazreen Alwan and, uh, and, and colleagues, we think that vaccination um, if you have a breakthrough infection, roughly halves your odds of long COVID. Um, you know, hard, hard to explain. We have some questions from our uh, online participants. Uh, the first is, uh, what is your opinion of the role of zinc deficiency uh, in the etiology of long COVID? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I have a strong opinion <laughs> about the role of zinc deficiency. I mean, you know, I, I just think that, um, you know, we meet with the various long COVID groups every few days to discuss studies and stratification and hypotheses. And all I can say is there's an awful lot to unpack there. Um, in our study, it's probably going to be a while until we have sufficient granularity 
to get down to the level of zinc deficiency. And um, is there an increased risk of uh, or rate of long COVID uh, with Delta and Omicron? And if so, do you think that's simply due to the fact that people are more aware of long COVID or um, or do you think that there is an actual increase in the rate of, of long COVID? Well, I'd, I'd be interested to know if anybody has any really hard data. Um, it's hard to study. Um, my gut feeling from what I've seen is that we have an awful lot of cases of, you know, 2022 long COVID in the period of the Omicron subvariants, not because it's more likely in that period, but just because we've had such an enormous global caseload. Um, so I think it's proportionally at that level that I spoke about of, um, you know, um, half of what one would have expected in an unvaccinated population, but that still adds up to an absolutely huge number. So as I mentioned in the, um, in the UK where I'm sitting at the moment, um, nearly 700,000 um, additional cases. And sure, um, all the long COVID studies, study cohorts that I'm aware of are desperately trying to put together their data sets of um, infection by different variants to try and work out if we can pin down any differences. But I'm not sure if I've seen any clear answers on that yet. And then we have a question from somebody who I believe based on the fact that it's Stephen D and the nature of the question must be from Stephen Deeks. Um, <laughs> are, are there any companies developing antivirals for long COVID? Uh, we've not had much success engaging industry on this question. Well, you know, I'd be interested to hear more. I mean, I just, my perspective on that is that, um, you know, for very good, very worthwhile reasons, I find many people in industry and all of the obvious players seem to be enormously interested and um, are certainly looking for partners for discussion. And I feel frustrated because it's not as simple as we need it to be or as, or as, or as they would like it to be. So if we could identify the people in whom we thought that antivirals would really help, you know, that is the surefire persistent reservoirs of infection people, we'd, you know, be in like a shot to treat them and you know why would it not work um, and yet why are we so stupid that we can't identify those people and can't agree how to, how to identify those people um, we thought it might be pcr stool samples um, but it's not um, some people i know think it's serum bio biomarkers it may be um, nuclear protein um, antibody theaters don't help um, and um, gut biopsies aren't very ethical um, so you know it's, it's just one of those experiments that sounds like low-hanging fruit and then the, the fruit is still um, out of reach. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of at least one effort to do a trial with nermatrolvir, but I'm not sure if that's actually getting off the ground or not. Um, so th th that will be interesting. And well, it must be done, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions in the, in the room? Otherwise, we'll, oh, uh, sure. Go ahead, Diana. It's Diana Finzi from yeah. the NIH. Um, so I'm, I was wondering if you could say just a, uh, a few words about the differences between um, the post-viral sequelae in the different um, virus, uh, viruses that you mentioned, and if there's anything that can be, obviously it's a long conversation, but if there are any quick take-home um, messages there. Yeah, no, it's, it's obviously a terribly important question. Um, the reason I'm hesitating to answer is I think all the answers are so um, broad brushstroke that they're hardly worth saying. Um, so, um, you know, yes, in all of those cases, we we look for all to antibodies and we find them. So at the moment, when I say find them, uh, you know, as, as you'll have gathered from my talk, a big part of our effort is on kind of dual cohorts in um, chronic disease after chikungunya and after SARS-CoV-2. And so a lot of comparative data is and will come out of that. Um, but I feel like it, you know, it would be kind of slightly foolish cherry picking to try and pick out common themes and slightly daft at this stage, because like I said, it's too, it's too broad to be, to be informative. Well, thank you so much for that uh, terrific talk and the very lively discussion. We, we should move on so that we can stay on time. I'm going to turn this over now to my co-moderator, uh, Sarah Reed, who will introduce the next speaker. So, 
So thank you again.